Good afternoon, class. Welcome to Civil and Environmental Engineering 201, Sustainable Infrastructure. Uh, my name is Brett Borp, and um, I'll be the instructor for this class. I think probably the first thing that we need to do is I need to maybe explain a little bit about the situation for this presentation here today. Um, about a year ago, I was diagnosed with cancer and uh, had an operation and a tumor was removed and everything was going along great until about a few months ago when um, on a regular checkup I found out that the cancer had spread to one of my lymph nodes. So as I speak to you here today, I'm actually over in um, the cancer center at Revere Health across the street from the hospital and I'm receiving some chemotherapy. Um, this is my last round of chemo. I've had four rounds, and I'll have chemo every day this week. So since I'm in the hospital right now, I've made this video to introduce myself and introduce the, the class. Um, so it might be for the first week or two, I may have to um, do the classes by video meeting, but... Uh, We'll see. We'll just see how that goes as, as time goes along. Right now, though, just expect to be here every Monday and Wednesday for at 1 o'clock. And I may be here and I may have to have a video meeting with you, but we'll see how that goes for the first couple weeks. So as I said, um, I'm uh, Dr. Borup. Um, this is my wife and myself. My wife's name is Kim. We've been married for 42 years and um, we have a really wonderful family. Um, just kind of might be interesting to you. My wife and I have a small little business that's called Paper Bandit Press. And I have two printing presses down in my basement. And we print a line of greeting cards that have won uh, several national awards for being like the best cards in the United States during a particular year. This is a picture of a few of our cards that we print, and they're sold all over the world, and um, so we have a lot of fun just kind of printing cards, and some of them are humorous and some of them serious, but uh, we have a good time with that. This is my family, uh, a fairly recent picture of it. I have four children. They're all married, and they all have children now, so I have 12 grandchildren, Nine of them are boys and three of them are girls. So, um, and we ex expect a couple of more probably before we're done here. So, well, let's talk a little bit about the class. We won't take the whole class here today, but um, I want to spend a little time um, introducing the, the class to you. And, you know, one of the interesting things about this class is that it's not going to be like a lot of your other civil engineering classes. Um, a lot of what we talk about it during this class, there is no right or wrong answer. And it really depends on your point of view. And because of that, I think it's important that you understand a little bit about me. Because I have a point of view that comes from my individual background. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I graduated from high school in 1973, which was a long time ago, I know. Um, I was in high school when they had the first Earth Day, and I was all caught up in that excitement of env the environmental movement at the time and got really swept up with it. And I was um, pretty active with environmental causes when I was just, you know, pretty young in high school and stuff. And uh, my father is a civil engineer, but a very traditional civil engineer. He was actually a transportation engineer that worked for the California Department of Transportation, Caltrans, for almost all of his career, and had a great job doing that. And um, I know he used to get really frustrated when I was always complaining about environmental issues, because some of them had to do with transportation, you know. And one of the big issues in the area where I grew up, I grew up in Sacramento, California, one of the big issues in Sacramento was they were building a nuclear power plant. It was called Rancho Seco. And, you know, nuclear power in a lot of ways is a really good thing environmentally. 
but in some ways it's a really bad thing environmentally too. Um, the waste that's produced doing, during um, power generation using nuclear fuels, the, the waste is really toxic and it lasts a long, long time and causes a lot of problems. And certainly if there's an accident at a nuclear facility, you know, there's a lot of environmental problems. But at any rate, I just got excited about that problem. And one day I had a bumper sticker printed up that went on the back of my our station wagon, or I put it on the back of our station wagon, much to my father's chagrin. But it said, Rancho Seco was built by the lowest bidder. Are you insured against a nuclear holocaust? Now, I know that's kind of a stupid thing. You know, I was I was 16 or 17 years old at the time. and um, But my father, you know, was not very excited about that opinion. Um, and he used to carpool into work with a bunch of other Caltran engineers. And he'd drive the station wagon, and they saw that bumper sticker on there and used to rib him about that. But he never took it off, and uh, he humored me, I guess, in you know, my environmental fervor. But at any rate, um, I left and went on a mission, served a mission and came back home. And when I came home, my father um, said, you know, why don't you look into environmental engineering? He said, you could learn how to solve some of these problems rather than just complain about them all the time. And I thought, you know, that sounds like a pretty good idea. So um, at the time, back in the, this would have been about 1976 at the time, there were only two or three um, engineering departments in the country that had environmental engineering in their title. One of them was Humboldt State University in Northern California, and they had a department of engineering that was called Environmental Resources Engineering. And I looked into that program, and it sounded great to me. So I went to Humboldt State, um, got married, and went to Humboldt State, and um, got my degree in the Environmental Resources Engineering Department at Humboldt State University up in Arcata, California, which is right by Eureka, California, up close to the Oregon border right on the coast in California. And um, I really loved it there, but it was a very interesting place. That engineering program, um, I got you know the, a degree in that program. I've never had a structural engineering class. I've never had foundations. I've never had um, steel. You know, I've never had a lot of the traditional engineering classes. I had statics and dynamics and strength of materials and all those kinds of classes. But then from there, all the courses that I had were environmental engineering related. So they were drinking water treatment and wastewater treatment, air pollution control and hazardous waste management and hydrology. So and never the, the classical civil engineering um, classes. So from um, from Humboldt State, I realized that to be a good environmental engineer, I needed to have a graduate degree. And I went to Utah State University and got a master's degree at Utah State where I focused on drinking water treatment, wastewater treatment issues, and uh, my thesis was in the wastewater treatment area. So um, when I was finishing up my degree at Humboldt State, I really wanted to go and become a consulting engineer. And um, at the time, though, Ronald Reagan had just become president. And his, he didn't have a lot of real strong environmental policies. And the, the market for environmental engineering really kind of dried up a little bit. So um, I was looking around. I had one job offer, and it was a really good job offer. It was with Exxon Mobil. And uh, they wanted me to um, negotiate environmental permits for their Western Production Division, which was... Alaska and California and all the places that they um, got oil um, in the western part of the United States. And I thought long and hard about that. And I realized that if I took that job, I'd have to represent the environmental policies of ExxonMobil. And the way I was at that point, I just thought with a clear conscience I couldn't do that. They offered me a really high salary for the time, 
but I declined um, taking that job because I just didn't feel like I could do that. So, any rate, um, at that time, one of the professors who was on my graduate committee got an endowed chair at Clemson University, and when he got to Clemson, he wrote me a letter and asked me if I would like to um, come and work with him and earn a doctorate at Clemson University in environmental engineering. And I was really excited about that, and I didn't have another offer, so I thought, you know, what the heck. So um, our family moved to South Carolina, where I got a doctoral degree in environmental engineering from Clemson University, which at that time was one of the top one or two programs in the world in environmental engineering. Probably still is up there in the top five. So at any rate, I went to Clemson and uh, got my degree there. After Clemson University, I went and taught for a little while at another university called Tennessee Technological University, and then was invited to come to BYU and work here at BYU. After I'd been here at BYU for a couple of years, um, the church came to me and uh, asked if I would move to Hawaii and work on a wastewater treatment problem that they were having in Laie, Hawaii. So this was a really interesting situation for me. I have always been really involved um, fighting for some environmental issues from the side of the environmentalists. And now the church was asking me to go work on a project where an environmental group had sued the church because they were in, vi in violation of some environmental statutes. And I was going to be representing the church in this matter. So I was on the other side, kind of against the environmentalists at this time. So I had a really interesting opportunity to see these environmental issues from both sides. Um, as a younger person, I was really interested in the environmentalist side of things. But later on, as I grew older, I was put in this position where I was the one who was kind of against the environmentalists. So I learned to see both sides of these issues. And that's a really important thing. Um, one of the things that I learned is that um, when you think about environmental issues, um, there is no clear right or wrong in many cases. There, there, there is right and wrong in some ways, but you can have different opinions based on how you feel about things. Now, I just bring this up because I think it's important for each of you to know a little bit about my background and where I'm coming from. Um, I think I understand real clearly both sides of environmental issues, and that has a lot to do with the sustainability. Now, being sustainable just doesn't have to do with environmental things, but it, it does. that's a large part of it, and we'll talk about that more as we go on. But at any rate, that's just a little bit about my background. So let's talk a little bit more about the course and uh, how it's set up a little bit and what's going to be expected of each of you. So first of all, these are the learning outcomes that are uh, assigned to this course. First of all, hopefully you'll be able to describe an, the influence of political and social, technological and economic factors on decisions involving the development of infrastructure projects. The second learning outcome is to be able to evaluate projects from the key sustainable pers sustainability perspectives. That's the financial and economic perspective, the social perspective, and the environmental perspective. And then third, understand the principle of the time value of money and use different formulas to convert between and compare at a common point in time, present values, future values, and or annuities of cash flows. Now, that last thing kind of seems really separate from the first two objectives that we, or learning outcomes that we talked about, but in that second outcome, you can see it talks there about um, financial and economic objectives. And to be able to evaluate things in that way, you need to understand how time affects the value of money. And that's a really important thing in your personal life as well. So we're going to spend a, a significant part of class just talking about how you can calculate and understand economic issues. Okay, so the course overview. First of all, you can see here 
the, the parts of the course that we have and the percent of the grade that's assigned to each. There will be a significant amount of reading that you'll be expected to do, just like pretty much any other class. Be worth 10% of your grade. We are going to spend a significant amount of time in class talking and discussion, discussing things that are important. So I'd like you to be here for that. And so a portion of your grade is going to be assigned to participating in the discussions in class and just being here. So that'll be 10% of your grade. Homework assignments will be given 25% of the grade. We'll have a, one midterm and a final exam that'll be 40% of the grade. And then you'll each be assigned a case history and a presentation that you'll, you'll need to make as a small group. That'll be 15% of the grade. There'll be regular homework assignments, weekly in fact. They'll be due, um, turned into learning suite by midnight on Monday. Um, you can have two exemptions for the late penalties um, during the semester. Um, you'll also be asked to certify that you've done the reading every Monday before you come to class, and that'll be a part of the grade as we talked about. Right now, um, we have uh, one TA that's been finalized. Bridger Gunnell will be a TA for the class. He has an office in room 395 in the Clyde building. Um, he can't be here at the beginning of class today, but he'll be here towards the end, and he'll in, introduce himself after um, this presentation's over and tell you a little bit more about office hours and that kind of thing. So let's start our discussion just a little bit here. Um, I want you each, for a minute, um, turn just to the group around you, get in groups of four or five or three or four or whatever, just the people around you, and make a list of what you think are the 10 most significant engineering achievements of the 21st century. I'm going to give you three minutes to do that, and then let's get back together. So do that right now. Okay, there's 30 seconds left, so complete your list and we'll get together and talk about it.
Okay, so focus your attention back up here again. Okay, let's listen to what goes on here next. So, this is a list that the National Academy of Engineering came up with of what they felt like are the greatest engineering achievements of the 20th century. So, how many of them did you have on your list? So, take a look at some of the things they have on there. Electrification, that's certainly important. Automobiles, the airplane, water supply and distribution, electronics, radio and television, agricultural mechanization, computers, telephones, air conditioning and refrigeration, highways, spacecraft, the internet, imaging, household appliances, health technologies, petroleum and petrochemical te technologies, laser and fiber optics, nuclear technologies, and high-performance materials. So the, the a National Academy of Engineers is a group of people that have been selected as some of the most they're like the most prominent engineers in the country. So they came up with this list of things. It kind of covers all of engineering. Okay, so, so there's the greatest achievements. Now, another group of people got together and decided or discussed what they felt like are what are the greatest engineering challenges that face society in the 21st century. So why don't you take just maybe a couple of minutes, well, let's take another three minutes, and see if you can make a list of what you feel like are the 14 greatest engineering challenges of the 21st century. So take a few minutes and come up with that list in your group. Okay, so about 30 seconds left again. Get your list together.
Okay, so let's turn your attention back up here again and let's see um, what a bunch of professional engineers came up with this, this, uh, with this, this list. So this again is from the National Academy of Engineers and this is what they have come up as the 14 biggest challenges for engineering in the 21st century. So, first of all, make solar energy economical. Then provide energy from fusion. Develop carbon sequestration methods. Okay, do you know what that is? If you don't, look that up. That's a really interesting one. Um, manage the nitrogen cycle. Provide access to clean water. Restore and improve urban infrastructure. Wow, that's what this class is all about, right? Advance health informatics. Engineer better medicines. Reverse engineer the brain. Prevent nuclear terror. Secure cyberspace. Enhance virtual reality. Advance personalized learning and engineer the tools of scientific discovery. Now, some of those things are kind of obvious, and I think you'll understand what they're saying. But some of these things are not maybe as obvious to each of you as they might be. So, and these are some really interesting things. Um, I would suggest to you that if you want to learn more, you can see a URL linked down at the bottom um, of the page there, www.engineeringchallenges. Take a look at that. See if, um, if you don't understand these things, come to understand them a little bit better. So um, there's some really interesting challenges there and some big challenges. Um, a lot of these things aren't just engineering challenges, right? The engineering is just a part of solving the problem, um, but it takes money to solve it even once the engineering's completed. But um, there's a lot of really interesting things here. One of the really interesting things, one of the things I find fascinating is there where it talks about advanced health informatics. Um, the whole idea of um, DNA and understanding DNA and what different genes in our um, genetic makeup do and how we could maybe improve health um, by being able to change those genes and everything. It's just really fascinating and, and pretty amazing. But there's some big challenges there. And um, so anyway, take, take a look at those things. But you can see that one of them is directly just has to do with infrastructure. And we'll, we'll end up obviously talking a lot about that as class goes on. But um, in, an interesting thing. So, oh. well, how does a strong infrastructure enable us to tackle the challenges that we just talked about that are the challenges that are going to occur, or the uh, challenges for engineering in the 21st century? So that's what we want to talk a little bit about here in class, that really if we want to do any of the other of those 14 things, or you know, those 14 things are listed. One of them was infrastructure. If we want to do any of the rest of those things, infrastructure is absolutely necessary to be able to accomplish any of those other tasks. You can't do any of those other things without the infrastructure to support them. So civil engineers are a really important part of any advances in engineering going forward. They're essential for a strong society in any way. Um, if we look around at countries where uh, we would consider developing or maybe not as, well, let's just say developing, um, one of the things we notice is their infrastructure is lacking. And a strong infrastructure is what makes a strong society. Well, you probably have, many of you have heard of um, civil, the American Society of Civil Engineers has looked at the infrastructure in the United States and made kind of a report card about what kind of a grade would our infrastructure be given. And they always come up with a grade down in like, you know, the D area for the infrastructure as a whole in the United States. 
I'm not so sure about that personally myself, but that's kind of what they have said um, is, you know, we don't, we have some problems with our infrastructure here today. How can we solve those problems and how we can, how can we do it in a sustainable fashion? So in this class, we're going to talk a lot about, well, what, it, what is sustainable? What does that mean? How do we evaluate if something's sustainable or not? And how do we design things that are sustainable? And how do we help society um, improve and progress by having the infrastructure that we need to be able to improve and to be able to progress? So that's kind of a little bit of the goal that we have as a class here today. Um, I hope we can have some fun along the way. We're going to spend some time discussing and debating. And my opinion is not always the one that is right. Um, if you have an opinion that's different from mine, that's just fine. As long as you can support that in a rational way. And that's what we want to be able to do, is to be able to rationally evaluate these situations and make decisions based on data rather than emotions. So, welcome to class. Um, I'll see you again Wednesday at 1. I may or may not be able to be in class at that time. It just depends on uh, how my chemo goes. So, when I get chemo, I, get, I, I, I have to go five days in a row, and it takes four or five hours each time I go. So, I may be able to be here or maybe not and but one way or the other we will have class so i'll see you again on wednesday then thank you okay well maybe we need to start this class by a definition of what infrastructure means okay so this is one definition that i think is a pretty good one that infrastructure is the basic physical and organizational structures and facilities so things like buildings and roads and power supplies that's needed for the operation of a society or an enterprise. So all of the physical and the organizational structures and facilities that society needs to operate is the infrastructure. So you can see that a large portion of that task is directly related to civil engineering. Buildings, roads, power plants, water treatment plants, wastewater treatment plants, um, all sorts of other structures that are necessarily necessary. Bridges, transportation systems, not just roads, but transportation systems. There's a lot of those kinds of things. Okay, 